So good evening. Um, I'm Rachel and I'm with uh, Cornell Co-op of Extension in Orange County and I'm the equine, livestock, dairy, whatever um, educator here. And oh, and we have a full house tonight. So I'm <coughs> Michelle Procia. I'm the ag educator out of uh, Sullivan County Extension. Uh, we also have uh, two more folks, uh, Jason and Ashley. I don't know if you yeah. want to unmute and just say hi. Uh, so we know um, if everyone knows. Yeah, hey, I'm Jason Detzel coming to you live from Tewksbury, Massachusetts. <laughs> You're not in the woo. Educator. I, mean, I can't turn my video on, so you guys are lucky tonight. <laughs> oh, I'm not um, doing video. <laughs> and I'm yeah, Ashley. Won't let me. <laughs> oh, sorry, Jason. <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm done. Oh, just I'm Ashley, and I'm part of the Capital Ag and Capital Area yeah. Ag and Hort Program team, and I'm tonight in Forestville. And we're coming live from Middletown, New York. <laughs> True. Uh, so we are going to get started. Um, so whoever, if people join in as they join in, um, this is really just a <clears throat> brief, like, well, not brief, it's going to be an hour, but it's an overview. It's just touching the surface. It's not really diving too deep into um, poultry production, but um, all of us are uh, willing to either send you information or, you know, if you have any other questions, you know, we can have our contact information um, and or reach out to your nearest extension educator who, um, who will probably have some information for you as well. Um, and also, um, Michelle and I do a poultry production six-week course with the Cornell Small Farms um, in the fall. So you can always um join us for that as well so, that's my plug um so we're just going to get started into our introduction to poultry production and also if anybody has any questions throughout the presentation um feel free to um throw them in the chat box or let us know and then uh one of us can uh, keep an eye on it and um hopefully answer um questions as we go or if we um need to table them till till after uh that's what we'll do all right all right, so the topics we're going to cover, uh, meat versus eggs, uh, breed selection, basic equipment, feeding, laying birds, meat birds, I think they're in reverse order, um, pest and predator control, and then turkeys and ducks and actually uh, geese. Um, so what type of poultry, uh, you know, so what, what are we going to plan on? How do you plan on? Um, type of production. Let me still. All right, so you have meat, uh, which are fast growing or specialty birds. So um, specialty birds would be like heritage breeds. Fast growing are your traditional uh, meat birds. Layers, um, what kind of egg color uh, or size production do you want? Organic versus non-organic, free range versus pasture versus commercial. I'm assuming with the audience that we have here, it, it's not really going to be of commercial size. Um, but these are all just, you know, what things to think about. Um, and more specifically, I mean, this is, we're talking chickens pretty much right now. Um, Jason and Ashley are going to talk about the other ones later, <clears throat> just to clarify that. And real quick, um, before um, we move into the different types of meat birds here, um, the idea is that you're going to base the type of production um, that you want to do, I mean, based on what you want to do or what your market or where you want to sell to, mm -hmm. um, what that market would, would allow you to do, you know, basically. So if you want to do meat, you're going to pick birds that are better at, at meat, um, layers, depending on the egg size and color, you know, just, just think about your, your farm plan and what you want to do. Shelly's going to hit on the farm plan quite a bit. <laughs> I might, I might say it a bunch of times tonight. <laughs> Planning always, uh, is best for preparation, right? Something like that. Anyway, so um, moving on. Um, so if you decide that you are going to do some meat birds, um, here are a few options for you. Uh, first up, we have our um, probably most popular commercial breed. Um, and I say commercial just because that's, you know, just what you see basically when you go to the supermarket. Um, but also it's really good for um, folks who are looking for some fast growing birds. Um, these birds are ready to be processed um, at about seven 
to nine weeks old, um, they're going to give you about eight to 10 pounds of uh, live weight, <laughs> <laughs> not dress, because you'll get um, you'll get about probably four and a half, five pounds of dressed bird. Um, but that's still really impressive for their feed conversion, especially it being at about seven, seven weeks or so. And the thing that they're best known for is their large breast meat, which is uh, really good if you're selling by the pound, you know what I mean? So um, the one thing that they're not good at is really like scavenging around pasture. Um, they like to sit, they're lazy, they're, you know, big breasted birds, so um, they don't move as well. So, um, but um, I've raised these birds um, and I thought they've done really well. Uh, next up, another one that you can try is the Freedom or Red Ranger. Um, I've heard them even called, uh, was it Rainbow Ranger too? But basically they're like a hybrid bird. Um, they're definitely more active in the pasture. So if you put them out and are doing them on pasture, they're going to be scavenging, foraging, picking at grass, bugs, and they're much harder to catch. So <laughs> <laughs> keep in mind that that's something that you don't want to deal with. Um, you know, it's, it was a decision for me. So <laughs> um, they are a bit slower growing. So you're going to have to put a bit more uh, feed into them. They are ready to be processed at about uh, nine to 11 weeks. And you're probably gonna get like a three and a half to four pound bird um, dressed. dressed at the end of it. Um, so it's still, you know, a perfect size. And depending on um, your customers, that's generally what they want sometimes. You know, they, they don't want like a giant bird. Um, it's just too much meat for them sometimes, but so these are really nice in that case. And then, of course, um, on a lot of the farms that we um, deal with, we see a straight heritage breed um, or birds that can be used for dual purpose. So they're layers um, that people just grow out to up to, you know, 24 weeks or somewhere in between there um to where they then slaughter them for meat after so depending on your market um heritage breed might be something for you um you know you're not exactly getting them that far into egg production where you're going to you know recoup some of the cost that it takes to feed them but um you know heritage breed is a nice uh alternative meat as well um, and, and you can use your roosters <clears throat> from your laying operation, if you get the roosters, you can raise the roosters to be your your meat operation of the heritage breeds. That is very true. So yeah, I mean, those are your three major categories for kind of be meat birds. Um, but so pick which ones you like. And you and know. also pick what, what your market wants to. We'll talk about that later. But just because you like the idea of pasture birds doesn't mean that everybody's going to buy them. True. All right, so layer traits. Um, <clears throat> Average to above average layers are usually what you're looking for for uh, laying hens. Even though you might find a bird that looks really exotic and cool, um, they usually don't produce a whole lot of eggs. Um, cold hardy, uh, if you're in the good old Northeast like we are. Um, vigorous, early to moderate maturing. <clears throat> Again, you don't wanna have to put so much groceries into them and not get as much out of them egg color uh so then this again is also goes along with your market or what you're you're interested in doing um brown white the blue or green um other other would really be like the really dark brown to reds like the morans um and there's nothing wrong with white eggs i know there's a list, whole uh stereotype about them being production eggs um but they're only in production because uh, they're uh, the breed of egg, the, the leghorns are, are one of the, uh, the, the best laying birds. So they just happen to lay white eggs. <laughs> they're, they're highly efficient, you know. So. Yes, um, and all eggs in the inside are all white. They all start out white from the beginning. Um, so here's just a, a chart. Uh, there's basically just do your homework of what kind of breed you really are interested in. Some are a little bit crazier than others. Some are a little bit more docile than others. 
Um, <clears throat> and again, the, the laying, you know, there are birds that are much better layers, like your Plymouth Rocks and your Leghorns are much better layers than your Cochins and Brahmins and fancy, fancy looking birds. So um, just, you know, look in, in the, uh, just do some research of what kind of breed you want. And also the availability of them too, which leads into <laughs> where do we get them, right? So um, this is probably one of the most common questions that I get um, a lot when, um, especially this time of year with, with good old um, our ag stores, you know, mm -hmm. they, as soon as the chicks get out, um, we get a lot of calls. But so if you are looking to um, diversify production on your farm, you're going to want to order uh, birds um, in, in a larger quantity. You know, if you want to make a, a financial impact on your on your property, you're going to want more than just the couple that you could get from tractor supply per se. I mean, you, you know, I mean, everybody has, uh, you know, you can get them wherever you want. But um, one popular uh, idea is to get them through hatcheries online <clears throat> uh, or they have catalogs, too, that you can order from. Um, but a couple here. Um, you know, in no particular order. There's, there's obviously more. There's Murray McMurray Hatchery, um, Meyer Hatchery, uh, probably, yeah, Cackle Hatchery I've um, seen. So the way that these are ordered is, you know, you go online and, and we'll talk about the different um, what, uh, types of birds you can order, I guess you could say. Um, but you won't make friends um, with the post office because these are going to be shipped via the USPS, so your, um, your post office person will definitely let you know when they have arrived, because they'll have lots of peeping birds, so, um, and they, they come day old um, in the post office, so it's, it's great, you know, you can order whatever you want, um, and they show up <coughs> um, pretty on time. You can also order uh, or, or go to farms. Um, we always like to mention here about you know biosecurity if you're going to different farms um, and also you know if you do purchase birds from a farm to kind of separate them when they come back um, like quarantine basically so that you um, have a chance to see if there's any disease or sickness that you're bringing onto your farm because um, it's always an opportunity when that happens especially when they're older, like if you're going to get pullets for a lay laying operation. Um. Yeah, so just things to think about. Um, also, you can buy from local ag stores like Track Supply, Agway. Um, I, don't, I don't think Southern States I don't think here. Southern, <laughs> Southern States That's is here. Nice. But, you know, anywhere that, you know, you can go in and you hear them, you know, once you enter the store. So um, that's always an option as well. Make sure that you, if you are buying in large quantities, um, that you're getting from a National Poultry Improvement Program certified hatchery. Um, that's just um, certified that they're free of disease, you know, the, the flocks have been tested. Um, so they're- Especially, is it Newcastle and- It could be- Merck's. Yeah, New, Newcastle and Merck's um, is something that they look for and uh, also Pelorum. And um, if you just, I just thought of this also, if you are worried about organic, because <clears throat> um, I had to ask about this and research this for another question before, or chicks, uh, chickens are considered um, organic from day two on because it is so paramount that they get this, uh, they, they do get vaccinated for um, these diseases because of, um, or that they're free of these because uh, because they are deadly to the whole flock and they, they spread very rapidly. So, um, so if you plan on being organic, you can still get organically certified um, because the chicks are considered from day two on. Good to know. Um, oh, and also if you um, do end up going with a hatchery online and you get day old chicks in the mail, um, super important that when you get them, uh, make sure you dunk their heads in the water. <laughs> Their beaks. Well, their beaks. Their beaks. <laughs> their beaks. <laughs> Not the full head. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
um, their beaks in the water when you get them um, so that it stimulates them um, drinking. They understand where the water is um, because prior to that, all they had is um, a box, <laughs> a box with, with sometimes there's like little agar solution, you know, some kind of uh, green or blue or whatever water substitute type thing. So um, it should be part of your process when you're bringing them into the brooder. Okay. All right, so um, when you're going ahead and purchasing birds, there's oft, often these three options. And um, so I just wanted to go through and um, kind of give you basic definitions here. Your straight run is something that they, um, they basically mix your female and male. There's no, you know, you'll get five males, five females, you know, you'll, you'll get whatever they kind of pluck out of the box for you. So this is generally good if you're, um, if you're going to buy for meat birds because you don't necessarily care, um, you know, whether they're male or female. Plus it's a cheaper option if you buy in bulk. So that's something to think about. Obviously, if you're shooting for female, you're gonna be doing it for um, egg laying production. Um, so you can either buy them either chicks when they come day old chicks, or you can buy them as pullets, uh, which, what are they, eight to 10 weeks old? Yeah. 12 weeks, something like that. I mean, each, you, you can check. Between three and four months, yeah. You can check, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the different um, companies, you know, what age they're um, offering their pullets at. They, as pullets, they obviously are more expensive than, um, chicks themselves. However, if you think about, if you do the math and you add up feeding costs, it, um, it, it, it's not so far off, you know, it's, it's, it's a They're comparable, ready to lay. yeah, it's a comparable number for you too. So just things to think about. Um, male, you can buy straight males or, um, just males. You can be using them for breeding if you have a breeding program or you can buy them just for meat. Um, it again would be more expensive to get just males or just females versus a straight run. Um, so do the math and figure out what's best for your operation. I also always like to throw this um, little thing in here. It might seem strange, but um, you do not need a rooster for poultry to lay eggs. Yeah, we also do this presentation to people who you know, don't ever really know much about livestock either. So, <laughs> but yeah, they, they don't need, they don't need the male for, for any type of stimulation for egg laying. So. Right. Right. Only for, for chicks, basically for breeding. Yeah. Okay. Uh, brooding. Okay. <laughs> so moving into, um, if you are receiving day old chicks or you are, um, uh, hatching them out yourselves. Um, you are going to need a brooder set up um, and go ahead. You can move forward. So um, I just threw a couple pictures here. I mean, the internet is pretty much a, a plethora of <laughs> pictures, you know, but there's always what to do and what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some, uh, you know, you can go on Pinterest and see all the different kinds of brooders. Excuse me. But the idea is that, um, the chicks, as soon as you get them home, they have a safe, um, more or less draft-free area with everything that they need. So they have clean bedding, heat, water, uh, food. Um, what? And just the corners. Oh, right. Corners. So um, Rachel's mentioning here, <laughs> as you can see um, in the picture all the way on the left here, um, that is a... Um, like a, a water trough. Um, this is often um, a good idea for starters um, because you can see that the corners are more rounded. What ends up happening are, is chicks by nature, um, if they get scared or too cold or, you know, they'll, they'll go to the outside of a, a box or the, the um, trough or containment area, whatever they're in, their pen and um, they'll start to bunch up and pretty much stampede each other or suffocate each other. So it's best that if you don't have tight corners here, um, like the box in the middle, that they can um, kind of 
they actually have a piece of wood there. I don't know if you can see it, but in the middle picture, they actually had put in, they, there's a piece of wood in there. It still kind of makes a little bit of a corner, but not as much. And then the other picture um, all the way to the other side under hovers, um, you can see that they also um, put some sort of material there to round out the corners. But. Yes, so it's a good idea to round off the corners so they don't crush each other and you lose chicks that way. So They're not smart. <laughs> yeah, so um, don't give them any opportunity to um, die, basically. <laughs> so um, you'll notice in each picture here there are um, heat lamps. Uh, I can't stress this enough that heat lamps are one of the most dangerous things in, you know, uh, like a home barn here in a, in a, in a starter operation. Um, make sure that they are well secured, um, got all of its safety equipment on, you know, it's shatterproof, all that goodness. Um, because, you know, obviously I, I don't have to go through it too much, but heat and electricity um, on shavings and barns with hay and straw, you know, is never a good idea. So please, please, please be careful when you are constructing your brooder, however it may be. Um, the picture on the right is also um, just as they've gotten bigger because they don't need as much heat um, from day one uh, versus, you know, however old, a couple weeks old they are there. Um, so you can use a larger area if you want to or bring them outside once they get feathers. Okay. So this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, I, I wish when I first started raising birds, um, to be honest, I wish I had this picture because it demonstrated everything I needed to know about um, how yep. their comfort comfort happened to me too. <laughs> so um, so my, my mistakes hopefully can be passed. Uh, well, not on to you, but be prevented. <laughs> so um, this is a picture of showing, you know, the heat lamp um, in the middle of the brooder and the uh, behavior of the chicks um, and how we can fix it um, so that they're comfortable and they don't have any reason to die, basically. <laughs> so on the top left, you see, um, you know, the birds are spread out um, all over the place. You know, everyone's moving around. Um, that's what you're going for. If they're huddling under the, the lamp itself and piling up on each other, it's too cold. So you're going to have to either lower the heat lamp or kind of well insulate the, the um, brooder a little bit better. If they're all to the outside and trying to get away from the heat source, they're too warm. And um, if they're, you know, piled up all on one side, um, they're, they are trying to get away from something they don't like on another side. So that might be too drafty. So you want happy birds, um, just milling all around. Stress-free birds. Just being happy. All right. Okay, so equipment needed. Again, there are so many different options. Just do your homework, ask questions, see what works, what doesn't work for your operation. You might change things as you get bigger, change, whatever. Um, but here's some of the basics. Uh, feeders, waterers, heat lamps, and fences. Um, and it just depends on your setup for, there's, like I said, there's so many different types. Uh, some of the pictures show that where you have the type of waterer where it's like a little trough um, versus the pail with the nipples on it where they can't actually step in it and make a mess. Chickens are dirty and gross and they don't realize that they're pooping in their water. They don't realize that they're pooping in their feed or that they're pooping on you. They don't care. <laughs> Sure. But it does matter because it is a great breeding ground for bacteria. Um, so laying needs, so anything um, now is just for laying birds. Everything else uh, for meat birds, you don't have to worry about this part. Um, but laying needs nesting boxes. One box for four birds. You do not need a box per bird. Um, but you do want to watch the behaviors of the birds because some birds do get uh, a little territorial. Um, you can purchase boxes, but if you're crafty and you want to make some or repurpose materials, which is my next slide, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you just want to make sure that the, um, the boxes are about 
one foot by one foot by 16 inches uh, deep. And that's a, a standard bird size. And most laying birds that are um, heavy producers are about that, you know, that size. You don't need them smaller or a giant size. Uh, you want to fill them with some sort of a, a um, organic material for bedding. Um, again, this could be whatever you have handy um, or whatever you decide to go with that might, you know, fit the needs of your operation or cleaning, making cleaning easier as well. Um, you know, some people use shredded paper. <laughs> uh, so egg loss, uh, avoiding egg loss, you want to either mount the nest boxes above the floor. It's always a good idea. Um, otherwise they, you know, uh, they'll step all over everything. Um, you want to provide enough boxes because if you don't, you'll have hens laying on the floor. Um, also, if you have uh, free range birds, just know that they also will lay in places you cannot get to. So there may be some egg loss due to that. Um, you know, it could be another, it could be a stall, it could be under a barn, wherever they can get to and they feel safe, that's where they're gonna lay, um, especially your broody hens. Collecting eggs regular, regularly will also um, help avoid with this, but if this is your, you know, uh, operation, I'm assuming that you're gonna be collecting on a daily basis. Um, so the get creative is just, you know, when you, you know, farmers are really good at, at being um, ingenious and creating things. So whatever you want to use on your, on your farm uh, for fencing or whatever. Real quick before going to the next slide. Oh, I already did. That's okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, put a plug here. Oh, yes. So this is... Um, the, the, these all these presentations about diversifying your operation. So depending on what the other operation is that you have that you know you're currently running, if it happens to be you know vegetable or orchard operation, um, make sure that you know you're doing everything um, that you were supposed to as, as far as like buying equipment and um, separating birds from um, produce areas and vegetable areas. Um, because you know the two do not mix mm -hmm. you know now with the new um, food farm food safety and FISMA um, standards you know it's super important that there is no fresh fecal material or manure mm -hmm. um, or you know animals that you can control getting into your vegetable or orchard operation so um, that means you know you're gonna need to separate them you know, as far as location on the farm or um, provide really good fencing or electric fencing, whatever the case may be, um, just make sure that they are separate. Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead. All right. Now the fun slide. So nesting boxes, you can pretty much make out of anything or you can buy them or whatever. Um, but I just like this slide because it shows some ingenious uh, repurposing. Um, Especially if you, you know, feed a lot of cats, there's some cat litter boxes or you know the crazy cat lady. Um, so whatever. So this, that's my fun slide. All right. So moving into feeding. Um, again, we're not going to go into too much depth. Again, this is all preference and what works, what doesn't work. And um, breeds. And breeds. Um, so you have your protein uh, to feed your percent protein um, and obviously energy. So what this has here is the 14 to 16% for pullets is that's the percent protein and that's usually how it's listed on a bag. Um, for broilers, it's a little bit higher. I will tell you, and I'll, I'll, I know somebody who did this from personal experience, they decided to get something that was higher than that for their birds to try to see if they would make them grow a little bit faster, and it killed them because they grew too fast. Um, so be, sh be sure that, especially with meat birds, that you are, um, that you know you are paying attention to the, the percentages of the, the protein because it's there for a reason. And you're also only gonna, they're only able to um, burn so much as far as energy and, and take only so much um, crude protein in before the rest just goes out the back. So you end up spending more money than you right. need to. Uh, 15 to 18% uh, of a layer uh, ration for, um, for layers. Um, and the other thing, I mean, these are just, you know, you can see that there's a range. So it does vary based on what 
uh, feed that you're getting and what the birds prefer to. Um, if you if you have like down by us here in Sullivan and Orange County, we have Kashekton Mills and Narrowsburg Feed, and they do their own. They can do their own rations. So if you have a feed company that you want to, you know, work with the nutritionist or something for for your operation, um, oyster shells are for calcium. This is really just for layers. Uh, your meat birds aren't going to make it that that old, so don't worry about it. Um, but uh, and if you do free ranging or or pasturing. Um, it may not be necessary, but you know, putting it out free choice here and there is not a bad idea um, so that you know, every bird has an opportunity to get some extra calcium. I know some people have used uh, eggshells, but um, I mean, I, I see the point in, in, again, kind of, it's kind of like recycling with eggshells, but you want to make sure that, you know, how do you know that those eggs have those eggshells are strong calcium sources as well. So that's why I usually say just stick to the oyster shells. Also, it could promote pecking yes, on eggs. Yes, it can eggs, promote so cannibalism on the eggs. Don't, and then, we don't recommend. Yeah. Uh, grit is for the gizzard. It is how they um, break down their food. Again, if you have free range or, or, um, or pastured birds, this is not necessary unless you have them like in a, an area in the winter where, where it's a little bit frozen or something. But uh, Otherwise, you know, and, and but they do need some sort of, you know, small pebble type um, grit for um, for their stomachs to work properly. And always, always, always have fresh, clean water available. All right, housing again can also get creative, but uh, clean, dry, draft-free spaces, um, except for obviously our 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 bug up in the top there is not draft free but i'm assuming that's a pretty warm day well ventilated uh permanent or mobile which can you know for for pastures um those are your two options um space requirements again this is just a what they need for space but you do you you do want to watch the behaviors of your birds and make sure i mean pecking order can't, you know, is, is a term from chickens and it's there for a reason. So you want to make sure that your birds are, have enough space to coexist together without, um, too much, you know, fighting or, or whatnot. So, um, you know, even though it says two foot squared per bird or, and then if you have a run, you know, that would be the amount that they would need for outside space. Um, you know, if you give them a little extra cushion, it's not a bad thing. Um, eight inches for roosting uh, for a perch. Um, again, this is just for laying birds. Um, then, you know, again, this is just all like what they would need. Adequate feed and water space, making sure that you have more than maybe, you know, depending on how many birds you have, but you want to have multiple sites for feed. Um, again, you get, you get bullies and timid ones. Um, Provide a fenced yard for the birds uh, to prevent straying and disappearances. But this is again where Shelly was talking about your um, food safety. If you do something, uh, if you if you do um, vegetables. vegetables and Butcher. fruit, berries, whatever, you want to make sure that you know those are separated. If you want to run your chickens through with your sheep and goats, feel free. But um, but again, you know. Chickens know, they don't know what boundaries are. Animals don't know what boundaries are, right? So chickens will go anywhere. They'll go in your barn, they'll go in your house, they'll go anywhere. Um, and also, uh, it's it, a lot of times fencing is really good just to also deter predators, which we'll go over later. So outdoor access. Um, so these are just, really this is all just, uh, oh, this is outdoor access, why, why do outdoors? Um, allow birds to express their natural behaviors, you know, like foraging. Um, they do give themselves dust baths to, um, you know, get some sunlight uh, that can provide a, a healthy environment because they're getting, you know, fresh air, clean air, they're getting sun, um, ample space if you're going with, with like a, a pastured or free range kind of thing. Um, and, but uh, there are biosecurity issues along with can provide a healthy environment. Um, outdoor space also in, in weather that we're gonna be having shortly, it gets muddy, it gets you know, uh, messy and, and um, wet, and uh, sometimes it can be cold. And also biosecurity with um, wildlife. 
Uh, so, you know, migration patterns and birds flying overhead and, and you know, droppings, th that kind of stuff. I mean, that's basically how the bird flu gets spread around. So um, just, just food for thought. <laughs> Um, so some of your options, we have portable or, um, you know, the on wheels, uh, again, you can convert any type of like a, a hay wagon running, running gear or anything from a forage wagon into one of these. I've seen campers used for these. Um, they're moved, you can move them frequently or infrequently. It's up to you. It's just an option to use for housing. Um, one suggestion I would make though is like what the person on the top picture is doing is you have a easy access to the egg collecting. If you actually have to climb into a space to get eggs, it becomes very, a uh, very daunting task unless you plan on having your kids do this, but they do grow. Um, uh, many different types. So, um, <laughs> yeah, send the kids. <laughs> send the kids. Send the kids. <laughs> Uh, so there's many different types. The one corn, these, these tend to be a little bit more for um, the one with the uh, PVC pipe. You're going to see that a lot for pastured meat birds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, just floorless shelters. If you have to move them a lot by your own manpower or woman power, make sure that they're, you know, you, when you build them, they're reasonable to move because you're going to be moving them twice a day, if not more. Hence the PVC pipe versus yeah. the, uh, the wood. Um, yes, and also just be careful of how you do the wheels too because um, you can see some of them have a gap and that uh, predators can get in those and, and all it takes is one predator to ruin your day. Um, all right, so just some options, um, pros and cons. Yeah, so um, obviously with any type of um, housing system, each has their own, you know, positives, okay, negatives geez. here. So um, if you're looking at um, these, these are the Joel Saladin things, um, you know, on the bottom that you've seen, um, obviously you can make these a little lighter for yourselves, um, especially if you're going to be, uh, you know, running them through the fields. So some cons, they can be really labor intensive and hard to move, and um, they really don't provide much protection from the elements. So, you know, um, if it's a hot day, just make sure, or hot in general, if you're doing this in the summer, obviously, make sure that there's shade. Um, some pros is that they're, uh, you know, you can make them however you want, low cost, and um, you put waste management here because uh, you're going to be moving this around your field, so you don't have to clean up any poop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let nature do it. Yep. All right. Um, just so the same thing with, you want to go over this too? Yeah, I'll keep going. All right. Um, so uh, again, the same with stationary pens. Um, obviously, you're stuck with, um, with what you built, um, so you're going to have to make more maintenance um, to maintain the run in the back there. Um, some pros are obviously that, you know, they're much easier to protect yourself against predators. You don't have to move. Um, if you already have a barn, you can just throw up a fence or a shed um, that's already on, on your property, throw up a shed around there, or um, I'm sorry, a fence, um, and you got yourself a, a chicken run. So use what you got in the farm is really the main takeaway. And moving into production planning. So this is something that I um, I like to harp on a lot, a lot, a lot. So if you're going to diversify your business, make sure um, it's profitable if that is one of your goals. So you're going to want to do a business plan. You're going to figure out research on what your market, um, you know, like if you're going to the farmer's market, do people want to buy whole chicken? Do they want to buy cut up chicken? Do they want to buy blue eggs or white eggs or, you know, do they want to buy chickens at all? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, you got to do your research and figure out what's your best um, plan of attack. Um, in terms, in terms of uh, also figuring out if you want to venture into this business, um, see if you're doing meat, see if you do have a processing facility around you. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, New York State, they're a little bit farther than one would like. So just make sure that that is something that you will have access to. And, um, or if you're willing to actually do them yourself. Or if you're willing to do them yourself. Yep. Yeah. So just things to think about. Um, also, it's best to have a veterinary relationship prior to a bird or prior to an animal needing assistance or farm needing assistance. So um, 
you know, if you already have livestock, I'm sure you guys have um, already spoken to your veterinarian, but um, you know, if you're getting into birds, um, just have a conversation with them. You know, they're more likely to come out at 2 a.m. if they already know you, <laughs> you know? So, um, and it's really the bottom line is if you have to have somebody come out at 2 a.m. for your bird, the bird is not worth the vet call. <laughs> just throwing that out there. That's true. That is true. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna breeze through these real quick so that we can get to the waterfowl. Um, just again, you're gonna hear us harping on everything is just doing your research, but make sure you have a plan for waste ahead of time. If you plan on doing pasture where they're kind of spreading the poop around themselves, great. If not, um, think about composting or, or some way to um, use the fertilizer. If you plan on using it for your own operation, again, like for um, other plants or around the garden or whatever, um, do not direct, uh, directly put it on there. It does have to have some time to either compost or break down because it is hot. Um, so, and for pests, it's just a reminder that um, animals bring pests, such as the biggest ones are flies and um, rodents. And if you already farm, you already have these. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's just a way, just something to keep in mind. Um, obviously cleaning things more often helps control fly population and then especially in the warmer weathers, weathers, weather, um, and then storing feed with, if you don't have um, experience with this, metal typically is the best thing to use against rodents because they can't chew through it. All right, and then predators. Um, you will get predators if you don't already have them. Other animals like chickens too. And this is something that you might want to think about even before you get your chickens. Um, I really wanted to have chickens at my place. I have bears in my backyard and uh, they really like chickens and they took out my compost bin, let alone a chicken house. So um, we don't have chickens. <laughs> so just something to consider. Um, usual suspects, canines, that's all types of dogs, including foxes, snakes, cats, um, that can even be your household cat, opossums, weasels, and birds of prey. Birds of prey can be a real issue for a lot of people, especially since everybody loves the bald eagles coming back, but they can take out a bird if they so, or so choose to. Um, there's a lot of information out there on um, how to predator proof and uh, also like, you know, what predator it might be based on what they're leaving behind. So um, just, you know, you can look those up or ask us. Uh, wire fencing, a uh, wire slash fencing, but, um, and electric fencing. Electric fencing is what deters them the most. Traps and guard dogs, but make sure your dog is uh, trained to be a chicken guard dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unless you got another pest. All right. All right, we'll mute ourselves and Jason and uh, Ashley, it's all yours. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna start with ducks and uh, talk a little about geese. And really, I know everyone loves chickens, but I really love ducks and geese. And so they're really similar to raising other poultry. If um, you know you have the infrastructure for for your chicks, a lot of it's gonna be really similar. Um, they are more expensive to purchase. That's the only thing. I was looking at prices today, and the ducklings, and I'll I'll talk more about goslings, but um, you know the they probably range from like eight to fifteen dollars. Like they were, they were quite a lot um, in comparison to chicks, which might be like a dollar fifty to you know three or four, depending on what you're getting. So they were more of an investment. Um, they're going to need similar things to other poultry, like I just said, and that includes heat as little baby ducklings. So maybe two to four weeks is going to depend on your season. They might need uh, the heat lamps. I also use these like heat plates that are kind of nice. They can get under under the plate and it's supposed to kind of mimic mom they get under like they would get under a mother um, and those have been pretty good uh, everyone assumes that ducks and geese really need water to swim in and of course they would appreciate that but it's not really necessary either they need enough water they're going to need more water than your chickens and they're they're super messy um, so if you have water like like these guys on the bottom um, they're gonna like that, but it's gonna be like just a disgusting mess pretty quickly. So just be prepared to to change it out. You know, having access to maybe a hose or something is really handy. Um, and then I try to keep the food and water far, as far away from each other as I can because they seem to really like to kind of mix the two, like get 
food in their bills, come over and get it in the water. So having them spaced a little ways away has really helped with cleanliness. Um, and again, you can totally use those little nipple waters as well. Uh, they might take a touch more like training, but, uh, but it could also uh, help with cleanliness. Um, so if you can move forward for me, Rachel. So just like they, they were mentioning, really knowing what you're wanting out of your birds before you buy them, it's gonna be the same for your ducks. Uh, so meat and eggs are, are probably the biggest things that people are looking for with ducks. You know, they're also a lot of fun to exhibit. If you've been to a fair, you know, you've probably seen all the, the show animals there. They're really kind of cool, just like walking around your property. Um, and these are just, you know, kind of an overview of some of the main breeds that you would see. And, um, you know, they're all going to be a little different. Like they talked about the heritage breeds earlier versus a commercial layer versus, you know, a broiler chicken. It's going to be the same for, for your ducks and geese. And so some are really geared a lot more towards higher levels of production and some are just going to be lawn ornaments. And, you know, so you have to figure out really what you're looking for. So I um, just had to do a little newsletter article. And one thing I wrote was like, you know, I, I'm guilty of this, definitely. So it's kind of the like do as I say, not as I do, because I get to the feed store and I'm like, oh my God, look at those, I have to have them. But if you can try, try your best not to do that and get, uh, you know, take a little time to figure out what you're looking for and then get the best breed for that. Because there's nothing like, you know, going with the impulse of the moment and then ending up with something you don't like. So, you know, take your time for research, research the breeds and how that would match up with what you're thinking you want for your farm. All right, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, like I said, they're very messy, uh, but you know, that's good and bad. So for me, I raised some ducks last year and my pasture really is terrible. Uh, it's really low in nutrients. And so them being really kind of messy was good for me because it spread nutrients all over, it helped fertilize. So it, you know, if you can use them in a way that's positive, awesome. Um, uh, this is a picture here on the right of what kind of a modern commercial farm would look like and they're raised on deep bedded packs and that's a great way to do it too. So having them outside is great and really similar models to what uh, they described earlier for the chickens or having them inside in some kind of deep bedded pack could be good too. But again, a lot more bedding than your, your chickens are going to need. Um, they're really easy to move, which is really nice because they're not, they're not really able to like at least... Um, I shouldn't like blanketly say all of them can't fly away from you, but generally they're, they're not like, you know, flying away. They herd together. You can kind of walk them, you know, where you need to go. Um, I just went to a farm in Indiana called Maple Leaf Farm, and they're the biggest producer of ducks in the country. And it was really cool because they just bring in like their truck when they're ready to process the ducks and they just walk them up a ramp right onto the trailer. Like there's no catching. It's you know, they're, they're pretty easy and friendly and all those kind of things. If you decide you wanted to go with ducks, um, they can be ready to process as early as 49 days. And they have a little lower feed conversion, I think, than a chicken with the chicken, maybe two. I think this might be a little lower. I'd have to honestly look. But, but it's still very a very good feed conversion. And that is how much grain I'm putting in versus how much uh, weight the bird is putting on. So generally, you're going to get to about a seven pound live weight with a 65% dressing percentage. And these, these numbers are based on the Peking duck, which is really like the standard meat breed. If you're going with like a heritage breed or, you know, a slower going, growing uh, variety, then it's not going to be this high. But these, these numbers are for your standard Peking um, commercial breed. And the nice thing about them is I raised them last year and they still were very like active. They were really great. Uh, you know, I think sometimes the Cornish cross for the chickens gets the reputation for being lazy and all that, where I'd say uh, the Peking was still like very active and a lot of fun to have around. Uh, so next slide, please. All right, so eggs. So I should have probably hesitated at that chart a little longer to highlight some of the uh, amount of eggs that these guys can lay. And it's really pretty crazy when you think like a commercial laying bird, uh, a, a chicken, uh, like those white leghorns that they mentioned, they might lay up to 280 um, eggs per year, but a duck can lay 300 to 350, which is really amazing. The thing I would say though about these guys is they're not always consistent about where they're laying. People that have um, ducks for, for eggs are often complaining that they're, um, 
just laying them like like if they have access to water they're laying them in the water they're laying them kind of you know just wherever they feel like like they're going about their day they lay an egg so you know that's not always the case but it can be an issue for people um their eggs are slightly larger and but the ducks in turn will consume more feed for that larger egg um, and they said generally they're they're a little more nutrient dense as well and if you do allow your birds to free range um they're going to be able to forage a little more than chickens if they're given that opportunity uh the egg is a little different and it's very popular for baking. It's, yeah, like I said, it's a, it's a maybe a richer egg. The shell is like thicker and almost waxier. And um, yeah, they're really great. So that could be a potential market for you. You know, if you're in an area that, um, you know, could tailor to uh, those bakers that are looking for something unique or, you know, a way to enhance their product or just for yourself, if that's an interest that you have. And, you know, I've eaten them, just like fried them up too, and they're still excellent that way as well. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So, um, yeah, those are the ducks and so geese. So there's all different types of geese as well. Uh, and so in the past, everyone's probably heard of like, you had a Christmas goose. And I think in the past, you know, it was just a lot more common to be raising geese for meat, where it's, it's not as popular now. Um, I went to Price Chopper uh, with, you know, just a local chain by me. Uh, probably two, three years ago, and they had this like beautiful big goose, but it just sat there for so long that they marked it down to um, chicken price, so so I would buy it. Uh, so it might be a, a touch harder to market these guys, um, you know, but it was really delicious. And uh, so they are, there's different types, of course, with these, just like the breeds we mentioned with ducks and chickens, and uh, like a broiler type goose. It could reach about nine pounds in eight to nine weeks, or a heavy type goose could reach uh, 12 to 14 pounds in just about that many weeks. Um, they can consume really large quantities of grass, which is really cool. So you see them out almost like grazing. So up to 50% up to of that diet can be made of grass. And they have a really great flocking instinct as well. So um, I raised a couple of geese last year and I still have them. They grew on me. I, <laughs> I kind of lost my um, interest in butchering them because they just had such like, fun personalities. Um, but as I was moving them from like pasture to pasture, I just grabbed like an old fence post to kind of use as like a cane and could easily just like, I walk them all across the property with really no trouble at all. So that that's a really fun thing there. I say they're easy to handle. They're easy if they know you, like when I have friends over. Um, just the other day, uh, you know, it didn't really work as well for me because there's a guy that I kind of had a crush on. He came over to help me and the geese were biting him. So, <laughs> so just a... Uh, with me, their owner, they're very friendly. With people they don't know, they're not as social. And probably everyone has heard like some kind of horror story. But I found that mine with me are very, very nice. Um, okay, next slide, please. So with ducks and geese, the big problem with slaughtering is that, you know, they're a waterfowl bird that the slaughtering process or uh, the cleaning process for like a chicken is... Uh, they're being scalded, it loosens the feathers, then you pluck them. Where geese and ducks, you know, waterfowl are designed to repel that water. Um, their, their feathers are also just, there's different stages where they're easier to pluck. So this slide is very wordy, but I just wanted the whole thing in there for you to look at. So um, earlier I mentioned 49 days for ducks. That's really the ideal time to get them to the butcher. So if you just put you know, 49 days from your hatch date, that should work, work out well for you. Um, if you lost track of that, you don't know how old they are, you know, um, whatever happens. So this can be a way for you to have a general idea of when to send them to the processor. Um, so if the tips of the feathers show, so if you're, if you grab one of these ducks or geese, you pull out a couple of tail feathers or a couple of breast feathers, and you see that the tips show blood or are very soft, then wait another seven to 10 days before slaughter. Maybe I would check again too, in seven to 10 days. And when the tips of the feathers are hard and easy to remove, it's time to slaughter. Um, and again, that will make your life really a lot easier if you're doing it at the correct time. Even though I sent mine at the correct time, there were still like feathers that they just, you know, that were hard to pluck. So that's going to be probably one of your biggest issues with processing these guys is just like good feather removal. All right, uh, next slide, please. So my ducks were very amicable. They, they were could be loud, but they were, they were friendly for the most part, like no issues where my geese, like I said, can be of, of very aggressive like no matter what time of the day or night I get home you know I went out with my friend last weekend I got home maybe like 11 I pull in the driveway and the geese are up like honking they're very alert they are very loud 
Um, and so if you have close neighbors, I would not recommend them. Um, and that said, it's like a double-sided coin. So that one side of the coin is they're loud, probably not great with neighbors, not great if you have maybe a lot of strangers coming to your property where they're gonna be in close proximity to the geese. Um, but they do make great guard animals. So that's the reason I kept mine. I raised rabbits for me. I have some layers and the geese, you know, they're kind of fun to hang out with and they've become great guard animals. So like I said, any time of the day or night, I come out, they're like honking and running around. Granted, they're not going to stop like a coyote or a large dog, but uh, I think they provide somewhat, you know, of a deterrent. And, you know, at least there's been foxes around that now um, have not bothered any more of my chickens. Since the 70s. And I think that might be my last slide. We might be going to turkeys. Turkey time. Okay. So um, I just want to say this is a great presentation that Rachel, Ashley, and Michelle put together. I'm especially happy that you guys have kept pushing the business plan stuff because obviously I talk a lot about at least breaking even in the industry that you're attempting to break into. Poultry in general can be a great lead-in or a complimentary enterprise to anything you have going on. I will say right off the bat, and if you want information about this, I can tell you that eggs are really tough to make money on, especially in small scale. You know, we found that organic eggs, you're talking like, you know, nine to $10 a dozen to break even. And that's not really, it. so anyway, if you want to learn more about that, let me know. But we're here to talk about turkeys. I raise a lot of turkeys. They're really fun. I'm going to get a couple turkey pets this year just from my backyard because I love having them. But <clears throat> I do also see this from a business perspective as one of those things you can actually make a pretty good profit from. I process turkeys every year at a local farm and they go from between about $125 and $200 a piece. Now, obviously that market is not huge, but there is this never ending market in New York City of people who wanna buy a piece of your ag knowledge and your agricultural know-how. And they feel that and they understand that by eating the turkey that you raised appropriately for them, however that may be. So turkeys are great. Like I said, they're fun. The pros are, they're really fun. They're cute. Um, they can make money like I just mentioned. They tend to be much cleaner than chickens. Everybody in this presentation has had something to say about the cleanliness of poultry. Uh, but I think turkey out of all of them are probably the most cleanly of them all. The real issue with anything in your backyard or anything on your farm is giving them enough space to allow that space to rest and appropriately integrate anything that they may be dropping on the ground, whether it be manure or even, you know, feathers or whatever it is that has to integrate into the ground. So keep that in mind. The more space you can give them pretty much overall, the better, as long as keeping them safe from predators. The cons are they're fragile and turkey poults are expensive, you know. I think I have one of my slides, roughly how much they cost, but eggs are like six bucks a piece and poults are about $9. I know someone that a couple years ago bought 200 turkey poults and they all died in a winter storm. Um, that's a lot of money, man. So, you're, you know, you're talking 10 bucks each, 200 bucks, that's two grand just out the, out the door. Um, and they're heavy. A lot of folks don't understand you're going to raise, let's just say you're going to raise a 20 pound bird or 30 pound bird. That's really heavy. You know, a six pound chicken processing or moving it is not that hard. But you got 10 turkeys that weigh 20 pounds each. You know, you're really talking about significant weight issues. And along with that also, not only is your processing going to be a little more difficult, but your housing needs are going to be more difficult. Look at these pictures here. I have some pictures of some roosts. Turkeys need to roost for the most part. You'll also see, especially on the top picture there, there's poultry netting around them that's electrified. I highly recommend that. Turkey tend to be bigger, and once they get through that fragile phase, they tend not to be as susceptible to predators, and that's especially bird predators but coyotes and things like that, and even raccoons will wreak havoc on them. Okay, you guys can move the slide real quick. Um, there's a lot of turkey breeds. The most common one you're gonna see is the broad-breasted white. That's the production turkey. Um, and you know, 14 to 16 weeks, you can have a 20 pound bird. That's pretty quick. And in another slide, I'm gonna have a little bit of their feed conversion real quick. But the heritage breeds, just like, you know, um, the Cornish cross versus heritage breeds of chickens are more fun to raise. They tend to be a little more, uh, able to scratch around and eat stuff. And they live a more natural life, in my opinion. And they're really pretty. These, this blue slate, I think the one in the middle is a Narragansett, and the one on the left is a, um, a bourbon red turkey. They're just beautiful. Um, and those carbuncles, they're ugly and beautiful at the same time, in my opinion. Again, too, though, when you're processing these massive birds, where are you gonna put all those feathers? Where are you gonna drop all that offal? Um, just something to think about. We're always pushing with poultry. Okay, next slide, please. Here's the big problems here, okay? So first of all, I told you they're fragile. The biggest thing, exposure. Any animal, wet and cold, is a recipe for death, period. Real cold generally tends to be okay, especially if you have a feathered bird. The poles aren't feathered. Same with the chicks. They don't have their real feathers on, so they're not waterproof at that time, and they can't really insulate themselves well. That's why you need to have them very warm and have a heat lamp and all that other stuff. 
Um, but the, I would say the biggest problem with turkeys is that they're susceptible to predators when they're chicks, just like everything else. And they're really um, susceptible to being dying from being, having exposure to the elements. Coccidia, you're going to run into it if you're raising poultry or rabbits at some point. Um, <clears throat> the name of the game, like any farmer now, if you're going to raise an animal, you need to see them every day. You need to understand what they generally act like. That is your charge. That's your duty as a livestock owner and operator. So you will know right away when your chickens are acting weird or your turkeys are off, okay? If they are, if they do, all these things really start with lethargy. You know, they're not, they're gonna, they're not gonna be fit, they're gonna act off. And then really scours is just a way to say diarrhea in animals. Um, you can treat that with antibiotics. You can go to Tractor Supply, you can consult with your vet, you can look online and get some good recommendations for that. Blackhead, I hear about this constantly. Blackhead is shared between wild turkeys and chickens and other types of poultry. I'm not sure if waterfowl get it. I don't see it very much, but when it happens, it's going to kill 90 to 100% of your turkeys. They're not going to have a black head. That picture right there, that white broad-breasted that died from blackhead. It can last in the soil for three years. So if you can keep them up off the roost, you know, your turkeys really should have roosts anyway, just for their own animal welfare. You're going to have a problem. If you are going to bite the bullet and raise chickens and turkeys together, keep in mind there's always that possibility that all of your turkeys will die. So I don't recommend it, although it is a very common practice. So is raising pigs and chickens together, which share the flu with humans. And we're going to see, or we have seen traditionally, flu shared between the three of us, and it's generally not a good practice. So just a little word of advice. If you do have chickens and turkeys, keep them separate if possible, if you want to avoid uh, blackhead. And then we always talked about, or we talked about predators, and Michelle and Rachel talked about that, and so did Ashley, and I want to thank them for that, because it can really be disheartening to lose a lot of your animals to predators and you are going to lose animal to predators. No matter how good you are, something's going to get in there, whether it's a raccoon, ox, owls, early morning, foxes are kidding next month. So they are going nuts. Um, even rats with chicks, you really just can't say enough about predator proof. And again, the more time you're out there, the more time you're paying attention to the animals, the better you'll get it recognized as the signs that there's been a predator in the area. Okay. Next slides, please. We talk so much about costs. So I just want to run this by y'all real quick. Again, look at the pictures in the background. On the bottom, you see a family with a general uh, production poultry operation, and there's an awful lot of turkeys in there. Not a lot of space, in my opinion. On the top, you have a more traditional backyard plan. You know, you sell all those turkeys there. There's 40 or 50 turkeys at 100 bucks a pop. That's a pretty good amount of money you can bring in. But let's look at the economics of it just for one second. I mentioned earlier that eggs are six bucks a piece. They're obviously straight run, like Michelle said, or somebody said earlier, you don't know if they're going to be boys or girls. Toms are significantly bigger than hens in the turkey world. Chickens, not so much, but in the turkey world, it does make a big difference. You're talking, you know, five to 10 pounds at times. Um, but even if you buy poults, they're going to be straight run anyway. So again, you don't choose them. Um, and those are seven to twelve dollars a piece, depending on the kind. You know, you buy up to so many, you get them at a good price. You're buying four uh, blue slate turkeys; are going to be twelve bucks a pop. Generally, you're going to need a square foot when you're brooding them, when they're poults, when they're chicks, and five square feet of coop space. A lot of people free range turkeys during the day because they are somewhat predator proof, especially with that electric fence. You'll be in good shape. Again, the more space you give them, the better off you will be. You're gonna need about 50 pounds to get them to 20 pounds live weight. That's only the broad breasted. That's only those white ones. The bigger ones are probably gonna take at least 10 more pounds, at least, no, way more than that, probably 20 more pounds to get to that weight. So really consider if you can make back that money by growing those heritage breeds, because you're gonna be putting a lot of feed to them. Now granted, a 50 pound bag of feed is gonna cost you probably 15 bucks for turkey. They need a higher protein level, but um, it's, you know, that's over a 14 week time span. So keep that in mind. Processing, you can do it yourself up to 250 of them a year with the New York State processing stuff. Cornell Small Farms is an excellent resource about all the legalities of that, and I'm constantly talking to folks about it. You can do 1,000 per chickens per year or 250 turkeys. You gotta pay someone to do it. They usually charge between six and $10 per bird. Plus you gotta get them there. Are you gonna move 1,000 pounds of birds to your processor that weekend? You're not gonna do it in the trunk of your car or in the back seat unless you want a really messy car. So keep that in mind. What are you gonna do about all the offal and the legs? The offal's What's inside that animal? You know, mostly when you get a turkey, it's gonna have the giblets with it. It's gonna have the neck, uh, it's gonna have the liver, and usually the heart. But the rest of that's gonna to have to go somewhere. It's really gonna to have to go to composting. But if you pay someone else to do it, they're gonna take care of it. But what are you gonna do with all the legs too? There's turkeys are a lot of leg, you know? And I don't mean like, you know, the leg that you eat. I mean the actual leg that stands on the ground. Just something to think about. They sell between three and ten dollars a pound. That's up to you, what kind of market you got. You're selling in the city to some folks that want to buy a piece of your agriculture. Like I was mentioned before, you might be able to get 10, 15 pounds of a bird. 
Um, if you're selling to neighbors or friends that are in your neck of the woods, three to five is probably more uh, likely. Um, you need a business plan, we're here to help. I don't care what county you're in, Michelle and Rachel have agreed to do every business plan in the state this year, just kidding. But they are a really good resource for you for poultry and so is Ashley, so is myself. So please take some time and contact us, we're here to help. Okay, next slide. This is my last slide real quick. Um, again, look in the background, you've got netting here, we've got bell and feeders, those are the red things there and the guy in the top right. On the bottom again, netting. Uh, Ashley mentioned the geese eat a lot of uh, grass. Chickens and turkeys won't eat as much of it, but they'll definitely knock it down. In that picture, you can see that. See the shelters, they need shade. They have to have shade. They can die in the summer. It's not the cold that's so much a problem for them when they get feathered out, but it's definitely the heat. But this small flock turkey production from Penn State is awesome. It's a great little fact sheet. It's the favorite one I've ever seen, and I've sent it to a lot of people. So check it out. So in conclusion for turkeys, they can be a great addition to your enterprise. Um, but remember, you've got to plan, 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 because everyone buys turkeys at the same time of year, every year, basically around Thanksgiving. You'd be lucky to find um, a market for them outside of that. So again, any questions, feel free to contact me. We'll send out all of our email addresses. And that's all I got to say about turkeys, everybody. Excellent. Thank you. And actually, it's funny you say that because I had um, somebody of a different ethnic uh, background that was looking for, <laughs> for turkeys to slaughter like in February. So you never know, there might be a market out there off season. All right, uh, so this is our last slide, but um, we can stay on a little bit longer if people have questions, but I know that we said an hour, it's past an hour. So if you got a boogie, boogie, uh, if you really want um, more information, um, you know, we're, we're all, accessible via email and phone calls. Um, all of our information is on our websites. So the CCE extension websites, um, you know, just type in Ulster CCE. We also do the poultry production that gets into this a little bit deeper. It's uh, six weeks. We do that in November, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, through Cornell Small Farms. Where to get the information about processing ourselves? What is required? Oh, that's ag and markets, but also um, Cornell Small Farms has a good, uh, if you go to their website, they do have the poultry processing guides. It really is what ag and markets has laid out, but in a much reader friendly manner. All right, well, thank you everybody. It was great to present to you tonight. Yeah. And, um, we will catch you next time. <laughs>